Now, I've got a little bit of a confession. This, I've put this together with a bit of a selfish motive. It was written for me. Okay? But I've written you in as well, so don't feel left out. But just uh, keep that in mind, that when I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to me too. I think we all need life transformations. Mm -hmm. But just looking through um, the amount of blessings, there are quite a few, quite a few uh, different transformations that Jesus talks about on that, uh, that mount many years ago, almost 2,000 years ago. But I want to take your minds back to about 1,400 years prior to this event where Christ sat the disciples down and talked to the people as well as the disciples. 1,400 years prior to that was almost the entry into the land of Canaan, land of it for the Israelites, and Moses gave the speech. You can find it there at the end of Deuteronomy, talking about <coughs> the blessings and the curses. And he laid out very clearly the blessings that you would receive if you are obedient to God and follow him and also the curses that you would receive if you didn't follow him and we in the future can look back at their travel and as you read some of those curses it sends a bit of a tingle up your spine to realise how true they were and forward just a little bit beyond Moses' death, Joshua, when he entered into the land at the Vale of Shechem, there are two mountains on either side. One is Mount Gerizim on the south, and one is Mount Ebal on the north. And Joshua put priests on either side. And on the southern side, Mount Gerizim, the blessings were pronounced. The same blessings that Moses had foretold would happen if they were obedient. And of course, the curses were also read out. And then fast forward that 1,400 years approximately to the time of Christ. Christ being also a leader very similar to Joshua. Doesn't pick out a mount that mount, Mount Gerizim, had been known as the Mount of Blessings. The Israelites in Christ's time knew that as the Mount of Blessings. But Christ picks out an unknown mountain, and it was probably for the benefit of not being um, revered in the future that it was unknown. And he sits his disciples down, and he lays out these conditions and these things that would have to occur if you are to enter into the kingdom of God. And that's where I've pitched my sermon from here on. Please excuse me as I read. Um, I like to write out my sermon so that I can say exactly what I need to say. Um, so look through that and um, hopefully we can gain a blessing each one from what I'm about to share with you. The Sermon on the Mount was intended for the disciples, but Jesus spoke it to the multitude as well. All manner of peoples crowded to hear Jesus, some from Galilee, some from Judah, Jerusalem, Perea, Decapolis, Idumea, Tyre and Sidon, and even the Phoenician cities. If you remember, this is about halfway through Christ's ministry. So it's approximately around about 30 AD. They believed that an announcement would soon be made. The scribes and Pharisees looked for the, the day that they would rule over those cursed Romans and possess riches and power. The poor peasant, he just longed for a life of luxury and ease. Each had their own view of the nature of the kingdom of heaven but Jesus was eager to teach them beyond that what the true conditions of the entrance into the kingdom of heaven was about. 
And so he begins his sermon, and we find that in a number of places, but chiefly in Matthew 5, with the blessings. His sermon explains what it looks like to live as a follower and to serve as a member of God's kingdom. He shared the major ideals of the Christian life, taught about subjects such as prayer, justice, care for the needy, obedience to the law, divorce, fasting, judging, salvation and much, much more. His words were very practical but concise. The whole tenet of the sermon made it clear that his followers should live in a noticeably different way than other people because his follow followers should hold to a much higher standard of conduct. So this morning, what I would like to do, I would like to begin this talk this morning with the end of Jesus' sermon, and then the end of my sermon, I want to look at the beginning of his. I'm changing it around a little. So could you please turn in your Bibles? There's just a couple of texts. Most of them will be up here, but for the benefit of yourselves, I think you need to look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I want to start at verse 22 and just read through just a couple of verses here to start with. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? There's a question there. And in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There's solemn words there. As the text indicates, not all who profess to be Christians are in fact Christians. Clearly we have a group here who believe that they are Christians and that they are right. They profess Jesus. They profess him to be their Lord. They even do mighty works in his name. But, as this text indicates, they are workers of iniquity. Sinfulness is their ultimate work. By Jesus' words, we should not think that special providences or miracles are anybody's proof of their work or ideas. Professing discipleship is of no value. Ezekiel put it very plainly. Ezekiel 33 and verse 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And this, the verse after that, verse 32. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. You see, professing to be a Christian is of no value. Doing the works of a Christian and even miracles and prophesying counts for nothing if the heart is not changed. The Spirit must do its work on the heart before we face judgment. And it is a presumption to think a belief alone on Jesus Christ leads to the saving of your soul. Clearly this can only be that belief causing obedience is the substance that saves the soul. 1 John 2, 4 puts it this way, He that saith I know him and does not keep his commandments, what does it say? 
He's a liar and the truth is not in him. So I've put together a bit of a graphic here. The truth of God, or oh, sorry, this cross here means not having the truth of God. What sorts of things would you think? I've put together two here. See if you think that they are not of the truth of God. Speaking lightly of the word of God. Making frivolous comments about the word of God or putting it in a jestful way. Or number two, putting impressions, feelings and exercises above the divine standard. I know what God's saying in that text there, but I just feel as though it's not applying to me at this time. So what about the truth of God? How do we know that we've got the truth of God? I put together a little bit more than just two here. Number one, obedience is the test of discipleship. Uh, I thus said the Lord is actually followed through and done. Number two, the doctrines that we accept or that we have actually kills that sin within our hearts. Number three, benevolence and kindness and sympathy is manifested towards others. Number four, the joy of right doing is in the heart. And number five, exalt Christ and not yourself. All of these are good elements to be able to distinguish that the truth of God is actually being portrayed, being said. 1 John 2 verse 3, Hereby do we know that we know him. What's the rest of it? That's right, if we keep his commandments. And you know there are other texts there that say his commandments are not grievous. Yes. Christ's teaching stirred up the people's hearts. They'd never heard words like that before. There was an attraction to his words. Divine beauty in the principles of that straight truth that he spoke. What actually was happening, the Spirit of God was searching out those hearts of those people. There must have been many in that crowd that realised to obey Jesus would mean that they would have to change. What would change? It would require a change of all of their habits and thoughts and actions. The change would bring them, no doubt, into a collision with their religious leaders. These changes would jeopardise that whole structure that had been built up over the years. And it's for these reasons that even though the people's hearts were stirred up, that Jesus responded with the following words in Matthew because he realised that they were listening to his words, but probably wouldn't get around to doing his words. So in Matthew 7, the very next text, what does Jesus answer with? Well, it's a parable. He uses a parable. And if you are a studier of the word, or if you read Christ's object lessons, you understand the reason why Christ spoke in parables. They are very powerful. And there are also elements that we can keep in our minds. They're pictures. Remember that saying, the picture is like a, a thousand words. We understand it. We can reproduce it. And it would have been able to be passed down. There are also people in the crowd there that would have probably condemned him for, if he had spoken the straight truth. The parable was much easier. But in this next parable, Matthew 7 and verse 24, <coughs> Jesus states these words in the next three, uh, four texts that I've got here. Therefore, whosoever hears the or heareth these sayings of mine 
and does them or doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. We were talking about this in, in the Sabbath school. The next verse, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. We've all heard this before, we know it. Verse 26, Everyone that hears these sayings of mine, and does them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. I tried to depict that image there of those poor people in that village having their houses ripped out by that action of the water. And verse 27, the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Those in attendance could see the valleys and ravines where mountain streams flowed down to the sea. In summer they were dry and dusty, but winter storms turned them into raging rivers, overspreading the valleys with torrents, carving out huge holes on its way to the sea, much like this one. Hovels built by peasants, no doubt on that grassy plains, were often swept away, and those in the crowd would have understood fully what he was talking about. But high on the hill were houses built on the rock. The houses built on the rock were reared with toil and difficulty. They were not easy to access. The grassy plain was much more appealing. Build your house down there. But these houses were actually up high, were built on the rock. The wind and flood no doubt beat upon them just like the other houses, but did little damage. And so it is the person who makes the words of Christ their foundation of character and life. They will stand when comes the judgment, for their character was developed on Jesus. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, and you know this well, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand for ever. Jesus himself said later in Matthew 24, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But how do we actually build on Christ? How do we begin? It is quite simple. You follow what light you have been shown. If you have a very small snippet of truth, then obey it. Have you ever read the Word of God? Have you ever read the Word of God as it was speaking directly to you? Then obey it. Set your heart to obey God's Word, and as you receive the Word in faith, the Spirit will give you power to obey. And then as you obey that light, more light will be given to you. This is building on the word of God, building on the rock, the character of Christ. There is no doubt that it will be difficult. There is hard work to be done. But we have help. Jesus began his sermon by assuring us of this, and we'll look at this later, but in Matthew 5 verse 6 he said, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, and what's the next bit? For they shall be filled. And the result is, as we read in the lesson here this morning, 1 Peter 2 verse 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 2, 21, which we read also, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. All of us together form the church of God. If each stone is anchored and glued to the foundation, then together 
No storm can destroy it. But if we build on another foundation, human ideas, opinions, forms, ceremonies that were invented by man, then we are building on that grassy, sandy plain. The structure will stand for a while, but when the storm comes, when judgment comes, it will fall. And when it does, as the text says, great will be its fall. Isaiah 28 verse 16 and 17. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. It is right now. Right now that the Saviour draws all sinners, all men, to him. But at the judgment, the reverse will take place. At the judgment, all sinners are driven away from Christ because they cannot stand to face him. It is now that mercy pleads for the sinner and draws the sinner to Christ. We need to make sure that we take that opportunity right now. And so it is. I want to cover just five points, um, just for a few minutes, a few more minutes of um, my speech here. I want to look at some life transformations that uh, we can take away from the Sermon on the Mount, things that will benefit us for the future, but also for our lives right here now. Ways that building on the rock can change you and me. The parable here, spoken of Christ, demonstrates the doer of God's word will be rewarded in the judgment. However, these transformations will be of a benefit, as I said, right here. So, I want to start at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, which is back towards the beginning of his sermon. Matthew 5 and verse 20. And I'll be skipping through just a few verses to cover these five points. Verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Point number one. Your righteousness must be greater than the Pharisees' righteousness. You can see I've snuck in a little um, bit of mathematics there. So, just a little bit of a quiz here. What two groups are contrasted in that text that we just had a look at? What two groups? Okay, the righteous, or the good, good answer, the seekers for the kingdom of God. Okay, and also the scribes and Pharisees. What characteristic is spoken about of these two groups? Their righteousness. And oh, that's right. And how should our righteousness compare to the Pharisees? Right, it must be greater, it must exceed theirs. And if our righteousness does not exceed or is not greater than that of the Pharisees or the scribes or the rulers that we're talking about here, what would happen? Ah, very good. You see it. It's plain, isn't it? Very plain. So let me ask you folks, are you wanting to enter the kingdom of God? Yes, I know you are. I can see, just like you, um, I am also. And if so, your righteousness, my righteousness, and our righteousness individually must be greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees. Otherwise, as we've just pointed out, we cannot enter into the kingdom of, of God. But what did the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees actually look like? 
And here's an ominous picture here for these um, guys. It's the best that I could come up with. The leaders would have been no doubt pointing the finger at Jesus and the disciples and accusing them of lightly esteeming the rites and ceremonies and the laws. And you remember that a little bit further down in Matthew chapter 5, Christ says to the disciples and to the crowd, I am not come here to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfil. Okay. No doubt the people looked up to these leaders as men of God. But Jesus was very plain here. He laid bare their hypocrisy. They were devoid of piety, faith and love. Later on in Matthew, Jesus actually was point blank with them and said, you are actually like a big white tombstone. Lovely on the outside, but full of dead men's bones. What they were doing could not bring, make them holy and, or in harmony with God. In fact, their rigid dogmatic religion was actually a stumbling block for other sinners. It was just like salt that did not have a flavour. Have you ever seen a lighthouse that has shutters? What's the point? There would be a lot of trouble. Perilous for souls. But you know that they were without excuse. The Old Testament was quite explicit. 1 Samuel 15 verse 22, and this is a popular text. Samuel speaking to King Saul. What did he say when King Saul had obviously done the wrong thing? To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. It's a nice little bit of poetry there, if you know anything about the Jewish poetry. But it makes the point quite clear. And in Micah chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousand rivers of oil? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. They had rejected Christ and his righteousness being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, as Paul suggests in Romans 10. Selfishness was their motive. Self was its work all the way through. Beginning to end, self. Self-righteous and proud of it. But let's be honest, folks. Our own righteousness is just as useless. For we read that text in Isaiah 64 verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. And if you do a bit of digging about what's actually been talked about with the filthy rags, you understand, hmm, but how can this be? Jesus states that we are to have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees. How could we be any better? How can we, being unholy, keep a holy law? Job 14 verse 4. Who can bring a, a clean thing from an unclean one? Not one. But yet it must be possible since the implication in that text that we read in Matthew 5 verse 20 is that we must have something better than the scribes and Pharisees. And here's a little clue. Jeremiah 23 verse 6. In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, that being the Messiah, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And also further down in Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 16, In those days shall Judah be saved, 
and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. God has offered his Son the perfection of the law. If we would accept him, then the love of God would dwell in us and transform us. Through this free gift of grace, all would obtain Christ's righteousness as the law required. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you know, to even confess sins, we need to see that we're sinful and that Jesus Christ is is sinless. And that requires a change of thoughts, a change of your heart. Only can the Holy Spirit do that. There's a, a quote here that I found in the Review and Herald, October 1, 1908. Christ has made some provision for us to be strong. No? Christ has made every provision for us to be strong. How much does every include? Is there anything left out? He has given us his Holy Spirit, whose office is to bring to our remembrance all the promises that Christ has made, that we may have peace and a sweet sense of forgiveness. If we will but keep our eyes fixed on the Saviour, and trust in his power, we shall be filled with a sense of security. For the righteousness of Christ will become our righteousness. There's a lot of power in that statement. And there's a lot of uh, things that come to my mind when I actually see that. I mean, how secure do people feel in this world that we're currently living in? Yeah. Yeah. You might or might not remember that last time when I spoke to you, it was about committing to memory those promises or just bringing back to mind those promises that Christ has brought us through those tough times. And here, Ellen White points out that they will be brought back to our remembrance and it will give us some sweet peace and sense of forgiveness. Moving down to Matthew, chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Notice that Jesus says here, if your brother has something against you, you, not the other way around. We are to make the thing right even if our brother has some difficulty with us. Right? The onus is on us. And here is my point number two. Humility will seek restitution. Brothers and sisters, if we possess a righteousness greater than the scribes and Pharisees, if our righteousness was the righteousness of Jesus, then the love of God would be in our hearts. The inworking of this love would result in us ceasing to hate. We won't be able to stop this love bubbling up and over and towards our brothers and sisters. In fact, we would be trying always to invent new ways to bring about that uh, kindness to them. Excuse me. A love that would empathise with the plight of others, even bringing to our minds the hurt and pain that others might feel because of what we had done. Asking for reconciliation from our brother or sister before we ask our, sorry, before we ourselves ask God for the same is true love. Think about it. Knowing there may be 
are wrong, unfixed, and desiring God to first forgive us would make a mockery of God's pardoning love. You know about that parable that Christ spoke about, the unjust um, steward that didn't forgive his brother. We actually must stop our offerings, go and make the thing right again with our brother, and then come back and worship God. What a magnificent God we serve. He prefers brotherly restitution before his own worship. This is true love. When we mistreat a brother or sister, we slander the character of God. We slander him by our actions, and more so if we made a profession to be a follower of God. The Christian, by the very name, carries a great weight of responsibility. To fully represent God to the world in our lives is the responsibility that comes with that name. No matter how small the error, or on whose side the error is, or who has the greater burden, we must make it right before we worship God. Making it right with our brother might require of us more than just words. Restitution in goods or services might just be the beginning. Did you defraud your brother in business? Has his reputation suffered by unfair or misrepresented comments by you? Make your restitution thorough. Seek out those whom you have spoken to and make it right again. How sweet would this world be if that was the, the norm? Think for a moment the wrongs that have been committed against you. Would you welcome this action others on your behalf? I think so. This is what that wellspring of love of Christ would do. Who could refuse this? It is the love and action of those in the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, don't let any wrong fester between you. Okay, Matthew 5. Let's have a look at this next one. Matthew 5, 39 to 42. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile with him, go twain or two. Give to him that ask thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Point number three, security in Jesus helps us to honour him. As Jesus was speaking to the crowds, everyone could see the presence of the Romans. Soldiers were walking and watching, lest at any time there could be an insurrection or the tension could ignite. A constant reminder of just how low the nation had sunk was ever before the people. The Jews hated this oppression, and more so since they were the chosen of God. Any small irritation could inflame the situation and bring the heavy hand of the Roman army. No one more than the Galileans shared this spirit of retaliation, and none more than the Galilean was willing to rise up and fight the iron fist of Rome. Remember that Jesus is actually speaking to probably a majority of Galileans here. A Roman soldier might grab a peasant and force him to carry their heavy pack for a millipacem or a thousand paces as the Roman mile was. The soldier was often cruel in implementing this requirement and so compliance by the Jew was never easy. With Jesus' command, the Christian would force the Roman soldier to acknowledge that his teachings, that is the teachings of Jesus, were more compassionate and loving and humble than the Roman system. 
that the Christian was more submitted to Christ than to Caesar. The people all longed for the cruel hand of the Roman Empire not just to be removed, but to be punished. So with longing in their hearts, the Jewish people expectantly looked to Jesus as their saviour from Roman oppression. But Jesus longed for them to see the real spirit of the law, the genuine action of the outworking of a life changed by the Spirit of God. Don't resist evil with evil. Turn your left cheek as well. To actually hit someone, a right-handed person on the right cheek, required that you give them a good backhand. That was apparently only reserved for a slave, a backhand. So by turning the other cheek, we now place the aggressor in the position of having to choose either an open fist with their right hand, or a closed one, to strike the other cheek. This was above a slave and more of a, the actions of an equal to be hit on the opposite cheek. You see, folks, it was not non-compliance Christ was actually teaching here, but over-compliance. A righteous life would be fully and overly compliant. It would serve to make the oppressor look even more unjust and abusive. But there was nothing new in the teachings that Christ was presenting here because the Proverbs of Solomon stated quite clearly, and I'll just state one before this, in Proverbs 20 verse 22, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. And this one here, say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me, I will render to the man according to his work. And Proverbs 24, verse 17, Rejoice not when thine enemy falls, and let not thy heart be glad when he stumbles. And of course there are many other texts. This was the same principle upon which Christ worked for us. For he gave up his position in heaven, and though enemies of God, he came to show us the love of God. To turn our hearts to him, he gave, he gave both of his cheeks to us. For we read in Isaiah 50 verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off their hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. And Isaiah 53 verse 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not, not his mouth. He is brought as, brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus actually practised his words that he was speaking here on the mount. Nothing came to Jesus that the Father in the heaven did not permit that should become a blessing to the world. And here is the source of both our comfort and strength. Whatever we suffer... If we have the Spirit of God working within us, then it must be under the permission of God. Matthew 6, verses 1 to 3. Take heed that ye do not your arms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, but when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doth. Point number four, don't emphasise yourself. Everything that Jesus preached was how he lived his life. He had the power but he chose to rely on his Father. Everyone that heard him preach could not understand this. Why wouldn't he use his power to save the nation? But their real motives, however, was driven by self-glory. Jesus here shows that self-righteousness was against the law. 
while appealing or appearing to be jealous for the law, they were actually breaking it. This is the spirit of Satan and reflected in sinful humanity. The Pharisees and rabbis were partakers of this self-righteous spirit. Now you know that when a king used to parade down a street, what actually went before him? Heralds. Yeah, the heralds, the trumpeters announced his arrival. And so Christ says here, don't announce your arrival and then also be part of the, of the um, procession. Don't, you know the common saying that we have today? Don't blow your own trumpet. Yeah, we have very strong biblical examples of this. Can you think of one in the time of Esther? Got into a lot of strife. Haman, yeah. Haman, when he thought uh, that the king was going to uh, promote him. Yeah. The Pharisees were trying to earn their righteousness and simultaneously gain worldly honour. This they did in the sight of people to gain a good reputation. And Jesus condemns such actions and declares that there will be no heavenly reward, but only the earthly re reward that they had gained by fraud. In our acts of charity, we are not to seek men's honour. Those who desire men's praise are working on self-glorification and are not real Christians. So where should the glory go? Of course, to Jesus Christ, by the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It was in the strength, in, in that strength, that we did the good works and that they were accomplished. If our hearts have been transformed by the inward working of that Spirit, it would show on our lips. You know, you think about the example of the angels. They cease not at every opportunity to, okay, to praise God. Um, Jesus early said in Matthew 5 verse 16, Let your sh light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. So this is where our praise should go. Now I've got a picture here of a mountain stream flowing down from those mountains there and you can see the type of land that it flows through. How would you describe it in the foreground there? Mm, sandy, quite barren probably. And you notice that on the edges of that water as it flows through there you can see the greenery. And so it is when the Holy Spirit flows through your life, it will be to those in the world. It should be flourishing. We should be able to flourish and show the Holy Spirit to those around us by our own lives. And you know, um, for God our work is twice blessed. It is a blessing to humanity in us serving them and also it blesses us because we receive as well. Matthew 6 verses 19 to 21 Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now I've put my fifth and last point here. No earthly anchors, but heavenly balloons. Just like in the Jewish age, the love of money was the driving force. Think about it in our world. Is it any different? When God is forgotten, Satan takes over to fill that void. Satan's service is full of care, perplexity, toil, and the accumulation of treasure. But you know, it's only for a season. Working in God's service, we build a treasure that is lasting. 
Every word we speak, every action we make, if it tends towards the character of Christ, then we are laying treasure in heaven. And I want to focus for this point on just two quotes. The first of these comes from um, the Third Testimonies. Excuse me. Every opportunity to help a brother in need or to aid the cause of God in the spread of the truth is a pearl that you can send beforehand and deposit in the bank of heaven for safekeeping. God is testing and proving you. He has been giving his blessings to you with a lavish hand and is now watching to see what you are making of them, to see if you will help those who need help and if you will feel the worth of souls and do what you can do with the means that he has entrusted to you. Every such opportunity improved adds to your heavenly treasure. And the second of these comes from Review and Herald. If the eye is single, if it is directed heavenward, the light of heaven will fill the soul and the earthly things will appear insignificant and uninviting. The purpose of the heart will be changed and the admonition of Jesus will be heeded. You will lay up your treasure in heaven. Your thoughts will be fixed upon the great rewards of eternity. All your plans will be made in reference to the future, immortal life. You will be drawn toward your treasure. You will not study your worldly interest. But in all your pursuits, the silent inqu inquiry will be, Lord, what wilt you have me to do? Bible religion will be woven into your daily life. There's some powerful quotes, but it points out quite clearly how we are to cast off those earthly anchors and how we can have those heavenly balloons to draw us upwards, to use the analogy. So folks, Jesus wants us to have his righteousness, something infinitely better than our own. This is the first and foremost work that we must be undertaking for our membership in the kingdom of heaven to be secure. The Saviour is very soon to return for his subjects, and I think very sooner than probably we imagine. I know you are longing to be in that group as I am. Let us desire above everything else to submit our wills, all of it, and then to obey his word through faith. Nothing else will survive the storm that is coming. So let's build now. And number two, humility will seek restitution. As we draw closer to him, we must by necessity draw closer to our brothers and sisters. Let us make every effort to forgive each other, even if the wrong was done to us. Through faith in the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. But not just forgiven, we have been restored and have become heirs. Love, folks, love. If we truly believe that Jesus' coming was imminent, we would double our efforts to help our brother. Think of what our Saviour has forgiven you. Do you suppose that these wrongs are smaller than the wrongs your brother or sister has made against you? I think not. We have been forgiven much and we need to forgive each other no less than what Christ has done for us. And number three, stay close to Jesus. Pray without ceasing. And in those moments of trial, we will be so secure in Jesus that those wrongs that we suffer will build our characters. Let us honour Jesus in our actions. 1 Peter 1 tells us that our trials will purify our faith, which is far more precious than gold. Building our characters and honouring Jesus through persecution and affliction is that hard effort needed to build on the rock. Number four, don't emphasise yourself. In the words of Jeremiah the prophet, 
In Jeremiah chapter 9 and verses 23 to 24, this is what the Lord says, Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom, or the powerful boast in their power, or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord, who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things, I the Lord have spoken. And lastly, number five, no earthly anchors but the heavenly balloons. Friends, nothing on this earth can compare to the riches of heaven. Everything we own comes through the good graces of our Lord and Saviour. Pray continually that God will show what you to do, how to distribute his wealth, when and where to support his cause. This will remove those earthly anchors that secured the rich young ruler and also Lot's wife. And as we shift our treasures heavenward, our minds will be drawn to that place. There are some very powerful quotes on getting rid of our um, earthly uh, treasures here that Ellen White has, spoke, uh, has spoken about. I chose not to put them in, but if you care to have a look, there are some very powerful ones. Five transforming thoughts for us to practice. At the beginning of my talk, I said that I would begin at the end of Jesus' sermon, and so I did. And then I would conclude at the start of his. You see, folks, accepting Christ's righteousness will transform our lives. It was designed that way. It will also influence those that we come in contact with. It will be a blessing to us and our relationship with others right now, right here. And so Jesus begins his sermon with the blessings. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And lastly, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I put it to you folks that these blessings that we've just glossed through are not individualised blessings for all Christians, but they are in fact all the blessings for an individual Christian. Just like the blessings pronounced by Moses before his death and repeated by Joshua on Mount Gerizim, Jesus speaks of all the blessings that the individual would receive as a member of the kingdom of God. And identical to the previous blessings, these blessings are predicated on obedience to his commands. Folks, Jesus is speaking these to you just as if you were sitting on that grassy mount. He longs for us to be transformed by his spirit, to have his righteousness, to have a life here in harmony with him. Take some time to go through the book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. You'll find some very good gems there in Jesus' sermon. Read the book and study it would be very good. But if you're time poor, maybe even downloading it and listening to it might be a good option. Pray and dig deep. And as James says, draw near to God 
and he will draw near to you. May God bless you. Dear Lord, we want to thank you so very much for coming down to this world. We don't deserve it at all, but yet you loved us so much that you would do this for us. There are many truths found in your word, dear Lord, and we know that just like we've read this morning, that you will help us, that you've promised to do so, and that there is no excuse for us not obeying your will. We pray, dear Lord, that the Holy Spirit may work in our lives, that we may see the things that the Spirit brings to our minds that we need to confess and ask forgiveness of. And dear Lord, we pray that we may all then unite because we are one with Christ and united on that rock. Help us, we pray, in our daily lives, for we sometimes forget that to ask Christ to be in our lives at every moment. We pray, dear Lord, that we may be strong and that you may strengthen us to face the trials that we do and the future that is before us. We ask this, dear Lord, in your name. Amen.